honored to have Naomi House visit us tonight. So Naomi, why don't you share your story a little bit better than I did? <laughs> much to Joyce and to Connie for inviting me and I'm really excited to be here in person because I'm a, a Rutgers grad I believe 2011 um, I'd have to check my resume it's been a busy past couple of years um, but I was an online student so I did all of my work from DC or wherever I was traveling so I'm really excited to be here today and I'm going to be talking about your digital brand and kind of not just the brand, but you know how you present yourself online and how you like people to see you. So that's definitely what I want to do. Share that with you. Um, let's do. Huh? There. Okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about me. Um, as you can see, I'm a Rutgers MLS student. While I was a Rutgers student. I was working full time, 3.30 to midnight at a law library as the circulation services manager and managing students. I was flipping houses. I founded Ina LJ after I found, it, found my first job on a listserv. And that pretty much cut out for a good couple of years all social activity, all books that were not assigned all television, things like that. So Ina LJ for a while was my life. I say Ina LJ, as you've heard, because it's the easiest way to pronounce my website, but um, it stands for I Need a Library Job. And it started as a simple little PDF shared amongst Rutgers students of jobs that we found on listservs, jobs that we found on different websites. We just wanted a one little kind of group shared effort so that we weren't all duplicating efforts. That's all it was supposed to be. It was not supposed to be a website. It was not supposed to be worldwide. It wasn't ever supposed to have 180 volunteers at one time and 550 over the course of a couple of years. And that was maybe not the smartest decision of my life. Um, more hands does not equal less work. Um, so yeah, I can talk a little bit about that as well. I'm now Chief Marketing Officer and Co-Founder of T160K, which is a social purpose corporation. And we do crowdfunding for projects that are established um, across Africa. I'll show you a little bit about that website. And like I said, I did all of this at the same time. I did this, you know, while I was in the middle of my degree program. So anything is possible. If you have an idea that you want to do and you're focused, you can get it done. You will have to make sacrifices, but you can do it. Um, and right now I'm based in New Orleans, although I'm trying to get back to DC sometimes, so we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'm gonna do that more than once, aren't I? One time during your presentation, I bit the mic. <laughs> <laughs> that was recently. Um, I'm first. No. <laughs> It wasn't de de demonstrative <laughs> of anything, other than I couldn't speak and hold a mic next to my mouth. Um, I'm a little bit, so I'll tell you just a little bit more about me. I'm a little bit of a loose cannon when it comes to presentations. Um, this is a really nice space and room. I was telling Joyce a story about one of my first presentations I ever did. I spoke <coughs> after Stephen Bell, um, Temple University, the blended librarian. And he was the first keynote, he got out there, he knew his material, and he walked around this giant ballroom, he was interacting with both sides. So of course I thought, yeah, that was exciting. I'll do that too, even though I don't know my material as well. I was planning on standing at a podium. Yeah, let's just do this. So um, learning on the fly, <laughs> as I'm presenting in front of a large group of people to once again, ACRL New York's annual meeting. Um, I realized there were many clever ways one could just pivot and look at one's material. Um, this is also a nice room in case you ever do presentations. It has a clock. Most presentation rooms don't. So I also had to tell the audience that I wasn't bored every time I checked my phone. You know, that kind of a thing. These are just little, just little tips I've picked up from speaking over the years that I wanted to share. Ooh, I was gonna do it again, wasn't I? 
this is what I'm going to cover um, tonight. Everything except for the very last one, um, stories from those in non-traditional fields, which I actually, one of my INLJ volunteers and fellow Rutgers students, Claire, is here tonight and she'll be coming up at that point. <laughs> You'd think, but I don't know if I'd be better with this. We'll see. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm not going to go in this order either. Sometimes when I'm doing a slide or a presentation and it's late at night, I just like the layout. I like the way the words flow. Um, but at least I wanted to give you some heads up on the different types of topics I would be covering. You can look at this too, and if any of them look interesting, you feel like I didn't cover them in depth enough for you, go ahead and ask me about them. But my main point that I really wanted to walk, wanted you to walk away with was the social media tools and how to use them. I mean, that's actionable. Everything else is kind of a little more, you know, it's informative and it's interesting, but how do you actually use these tools? I think that's what's the most important part here. And I think this is a good point to, to make right now is when we're talking about branding and we're talking about your career path, um, you know, I went to library school to be uh, an academic librarian, may not just fly with where you end up living, or it may not be the career path that you end up on. Um, you don't get to choose your career path usually. Most people can't be patient enough to wait for that perfect job. And the second point I want to make about your career path is there is no dream job. Oh, I've always wanted to work at this institute doing this, an archivist at the Guggenheim. The only dream job that's out there, the only qualification that will truly make it your dream job is the people, not the work. And you can't tell that from interviews necessarily. That's from getting to know people in this field and networking. You could be at, say, the Independent Community Bankers of America, which I was, their library and information center. I knew nothing about banking, but I had a fantastic group of coworkers and a great boss. I learned. Nobody could have told me, you, do, you will really enjoy banking librarianship. No, I won't, I would have said. Um, but I did, and it was the people. That's number one. So don't get your head wrapped up in, when you're looking at jobs to apply to, this dream scenario. I need to be doing this type of work in this type of organization. Um, be a little flexible. You won't know it until you try it, and you won't know until you actually meet those people. Another key thing when we're talking about social media, um, before we start getting into branding and everything, is personal boundaries. You are allowed to set your personal boundaries. If you are uncomfortable with having your Facebook account information public, if you're uncomfortable with anything being public, in general, that's your right. Yeah, it may get your, um, you know, maybe you won't get every single job opportunity because of that, but you have a right to your own personal boundaries and, and feel comfortable sticking to those. Um, I think that that's something that when we talk about social media branding, people will feel like, well, I have to have Facebook, I have to have Twitter, I have to be Instagram and Pinterest. I've got to be involved. And if it's not your comfort level or you're not going to put the time into it to do it right, it's okay. You don't have to be on everything everywhere. There is no one site you have to be on. Um, you know, LinkedIn is probably the closest to it. But I know people who are employed who are not on it, so that's okay. And one of the other boundaries I'd like to mention about social media is there's a respect issue and there is a professionalism issue with taking other people's content and sharing it as your own, specifically on Twitter. So if somebody said something really interesting on Twitter, I retweet it. I hit that button. I don't restate it in my own words. I try to elevate and push other people's voices up wherever I can. That's networking too, but it's also kind of just a respect for the work they did. Social media is work, and I think that this is something that, it's a small thing, but it's something that can be really key in establishing long-term good networking contacts. So what is branding? 
I've done a, a bunch of presentations on branding. Um, this, I think, kind of hits it right on the head for me. It's acknowledgement by others of something or the things you're good at. It's, while you can control a lot of how people see you, the brand only becomes a brand when somebody accepts that about you. I could have walked around all day and said, I'm Naomi Avina LJ, but if I didn't have a product and somebody looking at that product, for example, my blog or my, my newsletter, you know, I was only I LJ to myself. So that's, I think that's key. And I got this, there was a recent, I think it was February 25th, SLA talk. I don't know how many of you are already on Twitter and doing tweet chats and things like that. SLA talk is, I believe, monthly. And I liked this. I thought it was a really good, another succinct way of saying it. Um, you know, in today's fast-moving digital environment, personal and professional branding allows all of us to communicate our goals and interests, distinguish ourselves based on our strengths, and contribute to the conversations we are passionate about. It's not, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean corporate branding, you know, it's not necessarily a limiter, it's just sharing with others places where you feel strong. I'm, I'm a cataloger, I'm really into metadata, that kind of a thing. I'm actually not, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> don't ever let me catalog anything for you. I will do it different each time. I don't want to put spaces where they go. I don't want to spell things right. It just, I've done like basic cataloging. You know, I, I'm daydreaming, I'm not paying attention. It's all kinds of problems you will have if you ever hire me to catalog. So, don't. Yes. <laughs> okay, branding is controversial. Um, I mostly know it's controversial because of Twitter. Uh, <laughs> I come from, I told you a little bit about my background, but I started in libraries as a temp in special libraries in DC. That's like nonprofits, it's lobbying groups, places like that. Um, so it kind of started in, in they're very corporate environments, even though profit, profits can be very corporate. They'll have regulatory counsel you have to help and things like that. So I started in the libraries and I was hearing this terminology. It didn't bother me. I didn't feel like less human. I didn't feel like inauthentic. I just knew it was terminology and how it was applied. Um, not everybody shares that viewpoint and I think that's okay. I feel like there's still tools here that could be helpful to those people. I'm not going to argue with them if they're uncomfortable with using corporate terminology and things like that. I'm okay with that. I mean, I really think it's important not to spend a lot of your time trying to define somebody else for them. That happens a lot on Twitter and I have a picture of my face and how I feel about Twitter some days. So if you feel bad about getting your picture taken, I'll take care of that for you in a few minutes. Um, <laughs> Because I, I, I take a good, bad photo. These aren't even close to my worst. Um, something to look forward to in this speech. Um, and this is the, the teaser. <laughs> so there it is. So pros to branding. I mean, and once again, if you ever see a hyperlink in here, I'm going to have this hyperlinked on my website. And I'll send the PDF I've sent to um, Joyce. Can with, I post that for you? Yes, okay. I have one spelling error in it. I'll, I'll point it out when we get there. You'll, you'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> I could send you a fresh one. Um, so, yeah, I, I've cited who told me these things, where I found them, where I read them. If it's got a little at sign, I found it on Twitter, and that's the person who said it. I try to do that. I mean, there are very few original thoughts, even in this field, about the basic conversations that we're having about branding. So communicating your goals and distinguishing yourselves. Um, if you have a common name, you know, Naomi House is common it for, um, <laughs> not for humans, but for people who, for organizations that are charity and religious organizations that house um, children and women in need. And there's one in the UK. So starting, and there's also a wedding photographer in the UK named Naomi House. So that's why I, I, when I started, I, I knew I didn't want this to be the Naomi House Jobs blog. There's other Naomi Houses. I didn't want it to be personally based on me. I wanted it to be a little more open. So 
yeah, this is um, actually, that's, that's kind of why I went in that direction. Have those conversations with yourself, because if you brand yourself as your name, you know, even if it's a common name, um, there can be some issues with that. Maybe you don't, five years down the road, want everybody to know you. You would rather, you'd rather go into a different field. So just some, some things to think about. Um, you want to be correctly identified by your expertise, like the metadata and cataloger people versus um, competitive intelligence versus children's story time. You know, very different aspects of our field and, and you don't want somebody like what happens to me whenever I say I'm a librarian, oh my kid needs help with his homework. Well do you want him to pass or do you want him to fail? I'm your neighbor. I am not the person, I just said I'm a librarian. You don't know, what kind of librarian is she any good? He's got a school, there's a public library, you know. It, it's a license but it doesn't mean necessarily quality and I don't know if I really meant to say that but but truthfully, when you're talking to the public or people who don't know what we do, who haven't been through our degree, they may, they may have these misconceptions. You know, they'll always assume you're either school or public, for the most part. So, if you can say something else, just define what it is you do, that might help them along as well. So it helps you stand out. Um, you can use non-LIS <coughs> terminology too. Um, but at least you get to control wh what your identity is. Who is this person? Um, you're not speaking for all metadata people, you're speaking for your own specific skill sets within metadata. But there's the concerns too, and there was a great article by Karen Schneider. It's 2012 American Libraries, but I read through it again last night, going through the presentation again, and I really still like it. I mean, it answered a lot of my questions, it addressed a lot of concerns, it had the, a lot of the pros in there, so, I mean, it was just fantastic. I've hyperlinked it here. And, you know, concerns about authenticity, um, that's a branding concern. Am I really, is this really me, or am I just trying to put a fresh coat of paint on me? Um, that is cor corporate terminology. Boy, when I went to McGill, I mean, they were fantastic, but there was a small group of students who, when I talked about knowledge management and competitive intelligence, like, they were totally against the idea of librarianship in those fields. And I hadn't expected to come across that, so I, I listened to their concerns and it all came down to they saw it as corporate. Um, people are worried about it being misleading. I mean, what if, I don't know, something happens to me, I take an extra training class, and now I've branded myself as Metadata Naomi. Oh, but now I've fallen in love with children's librarianship. Can I rebrand myself? Will it be misleading? How do I go through all of that? And also, the lack of control, too. Um, while you can try to put yourself out as this brand, you know, this identity, there's still people who will be interacting with you and talking about you and talking with you. And sometimes, um, if you don't do a great job or it's just somebody who has maybe a misunderstanding, <coughs> it could steer your career in a direction you don't want it to go. So there are legitimate concerns to that topic. But this was the main quote I got out of the article. And branding is, it's really something that is specialized about you. I think we're all gonna have skills. We're all not gonna be generalists, true generalists, who are truly good at everything and fit into every little hole and plug. So, you know, think about that as well. What is it that you really want people to know about you? And if you haven't figured that out, there is no pressure to create, you know, Metadata Naomi Twitter handle. There's no, you shouldn't push yourself in a direction if you're not sure. Talk to friends, talk to colleagues, ask people, what do you think I'm good at? Um, and you might be surprised at what they like about the work you've done in classes and things like that. And two other concepts from that very same article, um, and I cited who it was that said, because I follow um, some of these people on Twitter, is um, to address the concerns of people, um, make sure you're doing evidence-based branding. So if I'm really good at coding, like Andromeda, um, Yelton, 
she went and made sure she had a blog and that she was talking on the topic and writing about the topic and she could point to things, actual, <laughs> actual work that she had done. Um, I thought that was really key. That was a, a nice point. And taking charge of that information, um, Boyan Kim is actually out, I believe she's, at, um, she's in Baltimore now, um, just did a fantastic keynote on the second mis machine age, something like that. It was really, really good. But she was talking about how, you know, she took charge of the information. What is it about myself? And then she started putting that information out there, talking about herself in these positive lights. Um, so brand is about what people say about you when you leave the room. It's not you. It's not the full you. How could it possibly be the full you? You're not the full you probably day to day. I mean, we all change a little bit day to day. So it's more about perception. Um, and once again, that's why it's controversial, but why it's also very important. Yes. So just some key little facts. I'm, okay, so I didn't say this at the beginning and I meant to. Um, there are a lot of people who like to do prezies. I'm PowerPoint. And the reason I'm PowerPoint is I'm going to write down a lot of text. I'm not going to read this everything and then switch to the next. But I'd like to see in general. That's how my brain thinks. I always think Prezi's look really, really cool, but I can never walk out of there telling you what map, where we went on that map. I was just like, I get enthralled by the design. So these are just some of the key takeaways I want you to have. If any of them really resonate with you, um, just reiterating, people will surprise you with how they see you. People, um, when I would get really irritated with people when they would, um, you know, talk about, for example, things they didn't like about my website, somebody said, well, you know, they see you as a leader, that's why they feel comfortable coming to you with complaints. I'm not suggesting that you do that with your leaders, but I had no idea that she had seen me as a leader. I kind of saw myself as a worker bee. That was surprising. Um, so, and, and helpful, very, very informative. See, you can take bad pictures, even when you're confident, like I. Yeah, okay, so that picture was taken back in January in DC. I was just gonna do a presentation. I thought I looked good. I had the ponytail because it had been raining. I was like, okay. So I took a ton of pictures, and I looked in the mirror. I'd take the picture. That was not the person I was looking at. No matter what I did, I could not make myself look like I did in the mirror with this camera. And so I made a face that expressed my displeasure with the event, and that's probably the image I will keep from that day. Um, it's also how I feel sometimes on Twitter and meeting people in person. Um, people will remember you. You're going to meet a lot of people in this field. We're very insular. We overlap a lot. Um, try, when you meet them, to put your best foot forward. I mean, it's a chance to tell them the best thing about yourself or maybe the best thing about them. You know, maybe they've inspired you for some reason. But for the love of whatever is holy, I have no idea. There's something about my face that inspires people to say, I love your blog, but. Oh. <laughs> If you just said, but I've instantly remembered you for like the rest of your life. Not because you don't have a right to say that, but really, that's what you're leading with here? I see thousands of jobs every single month. I remember people who say to me, hi, I, you know, I'm so-and-so, I'm a Japanese cataloger. It's kind of hard to find those positions. Any tips? Wouldn't you know, two months later, I see a Japanese cataloger position. That person doesn't have to go to my website or another because I've emailed it to them too. Take that chance not to fix their website. If I sound bitter, it might be because, you know, I just do not get why somebody would want to fix me versus use me, me to their advantage. Um, I think that's important too because we're people as well. I, I'm working really hard on these things. I spend all my time. We don't make a lot of money. This is important to remember. 
there is nobody in our field making a ton of money. <laughs> this is not, you make good salaries maybe, but nobody is a millionaire that I know of. So remember that about somebody. It's somebody who's working hard. What can they do for you? Not what can you fix about them? If it hadn't happened to me, pretty much every time I spoke, I wouldn't be saying it. So, sad Naomi is remembering Naomi. So, <laughs> Ina LJ. So we talked a little bit about branding. Um, Y'all, I would not have called it I Need a Library Job. It had this acronym if I had given it any thought at the beginning. I think it was October 12, 2010, a month after I got hired at um, the Census Bureau through a government contractor. My job was posted in two places, Catholic University Listserv and DCSLA. Why? Because it was a government contractor who was not a library specialist. They asked the librarian who was working there and had been there for years, they really didn't know where to advertise. Um, and that's kind of what inspired Ina LJ. I thought, boy, they could have gotten better candidates if they had just harvested from a larger field. I was already safe and had the job, so I could say that and, and move forward with this concept. Um, but I realized that people were missing out on opportunities. And I was very intentional about at least the I need a library job part. It's personal. This was supposed to be about the person reading the jobs, not me. Um, need, because I don't know too many who are in our field who are just doing it for fun. Um, library, MLS, MLIS, but also staff. Um, job, you know, it's work, income, and growth. It wasn't supposed to be volunteer, all of those things. I, I did want to limit my scope. So I pronounce it Ina LJ. Most people say I N A L J or, or the whole thing. I just call it Ina LJ now. So when branding myself at the beginning, um, I could have been any of my former jobs or any of my former identities. Um, I happened to go with library jobs, but I was a film school student. That was my first year of college. That's my first year of college photo in the bottom. Um, totally different person than who's standing here today. I was a vacuum cleaner salesperson for two days. I ended up crying when they fired me and, uh, and um, agreed to take $10 as my severance pay. Um, I was a community college grad, so I went to, you know, I was one of those many four-year students who drop out after a year, work at a grocery store, figure out what they want to do to, with their life, and go back to community college and have like 10 times the experience and, you know, really gain so much from it. I had been a teacher's aide in rural western New York State earning minimum wage. Um, but my rent was 150 a month. So, and this is like, what, 12 years ago? So yeah, I was earning minimum wage, but it was affordable. Um, I've been a grocery store clerk, a manager. I've been staff and a, li a professional librarian, although um, you know, I'm not wedded to the term. Uh, I started as a temp, and literally I have been a mover. When I was working at Ithaca College, my husband started a moving labor business where he, people would rent you halls, you can go to movinghelp.com and hire him to come to their house and load or unload. And his, the second job he ever did, the person called out sick, his assistant. So I called out sick and I was a mover for one day, literally. So um, I could have been the moving librarian. It was a lot, well actually I think the people helped a lot. I did as much as I could. It's not, you know, since then he's done several thousand jobs, but I did help that one day. So I had a, I mean, I could have picked from a lot of different things. I happened to go with this, but you, you don't have to pick what you're doing now to be your identity. These are the social media tools. They're not all of them, but these are the ones I'm going to cover. So we'll talk about them briefly. Um, so on Twitter. It isn't enough to follow. What I'll do is I'll go through my slides about Twitter and then I'll quickly show you my actual Twitter accounts just so you can get the visual. Happy to bring them up at the end again too. Um, I do think it's important if you're building your brand. It's not important just to use Twitter. You can be a lurker. It's okay. Use it however you want. But if you're building a brand, you actually have to participate and not 
within your own little tiny group, but with others outside so that they get to know you. Um, and, and if you're worried, like I was saying before, like uh, you want to be metadata Naomi, that Twitter handle is changeable. I was, so Elizabeth Leonard, who was a former student here as well, a uh, fellow alum, helped me start it, used need a library job as our handle because I need a library job was one character too many. And I kept it for years, always thinking I wanted to change it eventually. Uh, when I went with the new leadership team in 2015 and we had some new volunteers taking on a lot of um, the social media duties, I decided to go to Ina LJ Naomi. That means all of those old links that have my need a library job in them, it won't work anymore. It won't take people to them. And I was just okay with that. I was ready to change. But that was a consideration you can make. And I'm also at T160K Naomi, and I'll show you those as well. The other great thing about branding is you can participate in hashtags as well as hashtag activism. Um, the word I misspelled in the PDF is LIS microaggressions. I had one G. Um, <clears throat> I fixed it on here. Um, that's a fantastic one, especially for somebody who maybe has, hasn't worked in a very diverse library or just wants to know what their fellow students are going through. It's a good place to listen. Um, it's important to spend a lot of time listening on Twitter too. Uh, you don't need to jump in with not all. Had a Facebook confrontation today with family members who, when I posted something about social justice, came in with, well, not all people are like that. And I was like, dude, just, you didn't even need to tell me that. You know, you don't have to say that because we know humans are not all one way. Just spend some time listening. I think that's, that's important. We Need Diverse Books has made an impact. It's been fantastic. When the tragedy in Ferguson happened, just the awfulness of it, the library community, and the, um, the larger Ferguson community rallied around the librarian, and Scott B Bonner has now been um, awarded the Lemony Snicket Prize. So that was a real world example of librarians in that community and throughout the world interacting with people in the social justice cause and it reflected really well on the librarians in the library in the community and I thought, wow they took that and they really they really did a great job with it um, tweet chats are fantastic sometimes they're monthly sometimes they're weekly best way to figure it out look at the tweet chat handle and see when they're going to be back They'll say, back next week at 8, same time, same channel, you know, that kind of a thing. Um, so things like UK Lib Chat and INL is like once a month, but INLJ Chat is once every Monday. Um, I also look at things like Ask Forbes because I do want businesses looking at librarians. So I want to be recognized, and I'm one of several thousand people Forbes follows now, only because I asked good questions and I got in there and participated in several of their chats. I also like um, that with the Twitter handle, even if you lock down your account, and I just, the people who are following me now are the only ones that can follow me, that Twitter handle is still a brand. That doesn't go away. So you can have a locked private account that's still branding you. Um, you know, not as widely, but it's, it's just an interesting fact about Twitter. These are a bunch of different Twitter handles and different people who are making a difference. Um, the reason I chose this variety of people is because each one of these is actually serving a different function. Make It Happen Day is J.P. Picaro, who's a um, fellow alum of Rutgers. Um, he runs, you know, he founded ALA Think Tank. He came up with a handle that's neither ALA Think Tank, neither his name. That's just sort of a positive affirmation kind of one. Then you have like Claire who runs the INLJ New Jersey account, something that's branded and what to like an actual organization. Same with mine, INLJ Naomi and T160K Naomi. You've got ones like the LIB, um, which is the librarian in black, Cat Lady Lib, which is Annie Foss. She's um, you know. Very, she loves cats, but she's also a really dynamic um, young library leader. Um, 
Lothar was a very important one for me when I went to ALA. Her name is Dolly. She's, I believe, a library director. But I, was, I didn't know what she looked like exactly. I'm walking down halls in ALA, and I saw on her badge, at Lothar. Boom. That's how we connected. We could recognize ourselves, each other by our Twitter handles. That was fantastic at large conferences. Put your Twitter handle on, and people will stop you. You'll be surprised who knows you, or who you know. Um, Leonard, um, his name is Leonard. Uh, I just like that he broke it out, did something different. And then there are people like um, Chris Borg, who heads MIT's libraries. She uses one brand for Twitter and another for her blog. I like that. Same with Jacob um, Berg in DC. And I thought that was really interesting. Um, so these are some people at the end that use their own names in different ways. Okay. But these are Twitter handles that I follow. So you'll have access to these. I follow Hack Library School, Hiring Librarians, um, Library Lab Pike Journal, um, Peggy Garvin's Garvin Info is Government Information, Library of Congress and Careers in Federal Libraries, ALA Jobs List, because you'll often see the jobs there first, and LLRX is um, a law library resource. So I just like to have these in here so you can refer back to them and have some fun with them later and look them up. <clears throat> this is an example of how hashtags on Twitter can help you. I typed in Africa and librarians, both with hashtags, to see what was going on in libraries across Africa, talking about the larger Africa, um, the continent, versus you know trying to drill down to like Mali or one of the other countries. And this came up, and I thought, oh, there's a conference I didn't know about, a speaker I didn't know about. It's a great way to learn about people who are thought, thought leaders, um, I guess is the correct term, you know, on a different continent. Tweet chats, as you can see, is a little bit different. It's more com conversational. Um, you know, a lot of you probably already participate in them, but I wanted to make sure that that got on there too. And all of this stuff that I'm sharing is public. Um, nobody's account was private. You know, this is all things that you could find easily as well. I want to make sure that people felt comfortable with that. And on the left, you'll see what was trending that day, so you can click on those as well and be led to a whole larger collection. Oh yes, what did I say about that? So that's my other face. Um, so it probably looks a little angry. It might look extremely excited to you. This is how I feel about social media just in general. Um, happy, frustrated, all of those things at the same time. It can be a great thing. It can also be a rabbit hole you never escape out of. Um, it can be a way to make friends and lifelong connections and networks, and it can be a way to have really bad experiences as well. So um, it, it's got that double-edged sword to it. Um, I, I put question mark here because I couldn't believe that I was talking about Facebook and privacy in the same sentence, because um, Facebook's not actually really good about it, but you can make your groups private. Um, Facebook, you can make a page for yourself, maybe your metadata Naomi, the page. Um, and that's more like a fan thing. It's more of one person talks and everybody comments versus a group like ALA Think Tank or one of the ones that's so much fun is Troublesome Catalogers and Magical Metadata Fairies. Real Facebook group, tons of really great in the know metadata and catalogers. Look it up, they're, they're a great private group that has a lot of dynamic discussions. One of the reasons I didn't put an image here of Tumblarians, and this is really more just to briefly touch on the fact that, um, that Tumblr is a great resource for librarians as well for networking and branding, is because all Tumblrs, are, they look very, very different. They're all scrolling, but they have such a great way of design branding yourself. So these two links, um, the first one is from the Lifeguard Librarian Tumblr account, the most popular Tumblrian. Um, her name is Kate. And it's fantastic. It's like all the Tumblrians that have let her know that they're on Tumblr in one place. You can kind of play around both libraries and individuals. Same with the archivist at the end. Um, that person has created an extensive list. So it's a resource. Um, and they communicate, and they reblog, and they share. It's a great way of showing people what you're aware of, 
And in some respects, how you're an expert at something or on top on a topic because you knew to share about it. And same thing with Pinterest here. Um, we have an article on Ina LJ called 10 Inspiring Pinterest Collections Created by Libraries and Librarians. Just 10 of them. Um, and somebody copied and pasted. So I used their screenshot from our, from our article. You can feel free to click on these links when you have them later and scroll through them. Um, it's a really great visual way of organizing your data um, or, or your interests, I guess. So Pinterest can also be good. It's really important. I mean, I could stand here and just say Pinterest is good because blank images. Um, you got to play with it to see if you're comfortable with it. Go online and look at what some other people are doing with it and if it seems to make sense <coughs> for what you have as a specialty. This is my Pinterest. Um, you can see that we have a bunch of different boards. This is for my T160K organization, which I will show you in a few minutes. Um, the other thing we did is you'll see the highlighted text there. Um, that particular tag, that particular sentence is in every single description of every single one of the photos and will continue to be as long as we're tagging them, including repins from others. Because we're not just sharing these great images, we want people to go seek further information. Wow, that's amazing what that group's doing. Here's the direct link. You don't have to figure it out for yourself. Um, we want to make it easy for people. So I did want to briefly touch on a couple of things about LinkedIn. And even though I knew we were having a presentation, um, Angelique Simmons is the person that I spoke with on a panel at, um, at ALA. And she's fantastic. She runs like, what is the Fort Bragg Library? She's like library director. But in addition to being somebody who is pretty together and very organized, she's very successful on LinkedIn with getting recruiters to contact her about potential employment. Well, what's her secret? Her secret has been that the header there where she says chief librarian, research, analysis, training. Recruiters don't necessarily even know terms like metadata although they're starting to learn it more. Um, so she put in terms that she thought high-level leadership people would want to contact her about. And she's, and she's had success. The other thing she did that was a really good point was she follows recruiters on LinkedIn. There are so many different recruitment agencies for librarians in DC. It's not called this anymore, but like Track Legal and Libraries was where I got my start. And I followed their recruiters on LinkedIn. I followed InfoCurrents. And whenever they had a job, they want to make their job as easy as possible to find somebody who's qualified quickly. Well, there were two places they were looking. They were looking on LinkedIn, and they were looking at Monster.com. And as long as you were updating your um, resume once a month on Monster.com, you were coming to the top of the pile. I know a couple people who were hired off of Monster.com, which stunned me. Um, but it was because the recruiters didn't know there were better resources out there for them. Um, another nice thing about LinkedIn is that you can belong to private groups as well, so you don't have to worry about Google harvesting your private conversations and those showing up when employers are looking for them. So she was fantastic. She's, a, she's often at these um, federal libraries panels. I think she's really, really great. Um, so. I wanted to bring her in there. And as you can see, I changed mine from being a sentence headline to being um, all these different uh, ones that I felt were good fits for me. I haven't been recruited like she has, though. Um, mostly Aetna calls me, or people who really haven't read my resume or my LinkedIn profile. It's really clear after five seconds that they were just throwing darts. Um, but it's nice to know that it's been somebody's been successful. I'm going to quickly cover the types of jobs and jobs families. And I want the point that I really want to make is your MLIS, your MI, your LIS is not a limiter. It opens doors, it doesn't close them, and it shouldn't. Um, 
you know, I think sometimes people think, well, now I'm stuck in this field or doing this particular group of things. I don't, I never saw it that way. Um, it opens more doors, doors that you didn't have without that degree. So that's something that's been really important to me. If you're familiar with my website, which I'll show you very quickly at the end, these are some of the different job titles. I highlighted several in green. Um, <clears throat> right in the middle, um, these are actually found on my website, inalj.com, on the left sidebar on every single page. Um, the, just a few I highlighted in green. Um, the one in the middle, transactional law researcher. When I was relocating to DC and I had an associate's degree, but experience in a library and research experience, I decided to look up all the vendors in DC and see what was on their pages and what qualifications. So I typed a researcher. I found that job. I applied. They said, name your salary. Well, the reason they said name your salary was because it's actually a horrible, horrible job. Um, I was going to be working mid-shift, so 2 to 11, answering calls from lawyers about SEC filings with a 15-minute turnaround period. They did not keep people in that job long. Um, but they needed people, and I had an associate, but I had that library experience. And I didn't just look at library jobs. I knew I was going to be desperate for a job when I, when I got to DC, so I wanted to kind of get in there and try something different. The other one that um, at the very bottom, data visualization, while it's kind of something that more butts up against a lot of the LIS positions, um, I wanted to bring it to your attention especially anybody who has statistics backgrounds or art backgrounds. Um, it, it might be a field you'd be interested in. Um, okay, so competitive intelligence. Um, briefly go through these. You know, CI is a great field, and now you guys have classes on CI, I believe, at Rutgers. Um, right before I graduated, or right after I graduated, I remember Lilia um, had started uh, a class. Um, I got the syllabus, I'm so excited. Sad I missed it, but it was a really exciting field. Um, you know, you research companies, and you're basically just trying to figure out what the competitive advantages are, what the risks are for the company. You're doing research and market trends, so it's definitely biz work and legal work, but a lot of people find it interesting. Another one I want to mention quickly is informationist. This is a real position at the National Institutes for Health. And I know a lot of people have um, PhDs, for example. Working in an academic library isn't the only thing you can do with a PhD. Like, I've got my master's and my PhD. At NIH, these are subject specialists who work with their researchers that have those information skills, those library skills. Um, and they're doing really high level like health informatics and things like that. So it's exciting to see in government that you know, slow moving government that they were doing something pretty pretty radical and pretty um, pretty new to our field. Knowledge management, um, and, and the reason I'm covering these is because a lot of the traditional jobs you already know about, um, that's not saying that these are better or worse, it's just maybe these are ones you didn't know as much about. Also Rutgers is an incredible location for knowledge management. Um, because you have Claire and you have, um, you know, coursework here, you have like an institute, it's, it's just that this was a really good location and I took a KM class while I was here. Um, you know, I took the class, but it's also another one of those classes that helped me go, aha, I'm not good at organizing things, I'm not good at, you know, really laying it all out and figuring out like information architecture and things like that. Um, that was more for others who aren't as easily distracted. Okay. And the final job title, I just want to briefly say that, hey, maybe you could be doing this, is one that I'm doing, which is CMO, Chief Marketing Officer. Um, I happened to go to a conference in South Africa. I was traveling there anyway for vacation because we got cheap tickets. Take advantage of cheap tickets. You're on the East Coast. In New Orleans, we do not have cheap tickets, and it's so sad. Um, so we got cheap tickets and I just contacted a conference and asked if I could speak, if they had any openings. Because like, what's the worst they're going to say? No. Um, and it's on another continent. Yeah, probably, probably won't remember me. 
Um, they said yes, and it's changed my life. Um, because I was put on a panel with Stephanie Jakaiti, and she helped rescue the Timbuktu manuscripts. And long story short, long bus ride, lots of chatter, reconnecting in America. I got offered a chance to participate on the co-founding of an organization. Um, so chief marketing officer. I do, have a, I do have the website open as well. I'll show you guys that in a minute. Think about job families, maybe not just job titles. Um, you know, where, where those skill sets overlap. <coughs> because you might be able to be happy in a variety of different jobs. Federal jobs are special. Um, the 1400 series, I believe, is librarians. But there's tons of series. Um, they usually start with two digits and then some other two digits. Um, that's why I said 1400 series, but you see the number 14. The 1000 series, the 1700 series. These are all things that when you go to usajobs.gov, you know, they might be potential jobs for you. Um, so, so thinking outside of the scope based on your skill sets. But if you do file, you know, do federal resumes, please be sure to be repetitious. I'm really good at getting federal interviews, much better than getting the job. And sometimes, you know, I just had to look at the people who are interviewing and being like, yeah, you're probably wondering how I'm the one that ended up being one of your two candidates. I was just really good at being repetitious. And by that I mean a computer reads federal resumes and the computer, not a human, selects who gets that interview. So, you know, when I worked at ICBA, I was a metadata cataloger. I cataloged using Iliad. I used these modules. Next sentence. When I worked at Georgetown Law Library, <laughs> um, computers like, wow, she did it a million times. She's brilliant. Um, you know, that's how I ended up getting an interview with a spelling and grammar riddled um, application through to the top levels at the Library of Congress. They were shocked. <laughs> I had submitted accidentally my draft copy. And once you hit that submit button, there was no going back. So I got called. They're pulling it out and I was like, boy, you must think. I so I brought the corrected copy and gave them each the copy. They hired somebody else. It was the right choice. Um, <laughs> but they sure, they're never going to forget me. So, <laughs> And I owned up to my mistake. I said I was burning the candle at both ends. But um, Hopefully, eventually, in 10 years, they'll, that information will filter down and they'll do something about this issue they have with federal resumes. Um, while I'll wrap up with this statement, I'm also going to go out to the web very, very quickly and show you my websites. Um, you know, it can be really challenging when you're looking for a job to really just, you need that job, you know, you need to pay bills, you need to pay your student loans back, but a really stressful job, and this is why I was saying it's so important that you get work with people that you like or it's a good environment and a healthy environment more than the work you're doing, um, it can affect your health, it can affect your functionality, it can affect all point, parts of your life. So don't try to fake how you are. And by that, I can give you a really good example. Um, we're librarians. We're supposed to be organized. We're supposed to be grammar experts and whatever, um, spelling experts. <laughs> um, not my skill set. But heaven help me, why in every interview, at least for the first couple of years, when they're talking about my qualifications, I was trying to fake being organized as opposed to think about what I'm really good at, because that's what they wanted to hear. They wanted to hear this. This is a problem with interviewers as well. Sometimes they don't know what they need. They know what they think they should need. Um, but it wasn't for the best. Those aren't jobs that lasted it long. They aren't jobs where everybody was happy. It's not worth getting that paycheck to be miserable and to make everybody else miserable and to hurt your reputation. So don't try to fake it. Um, I think that's really, really key. So what I'm going to do, one second, is just quickly take you through my, my um, 
you know, my social media profiles. This is my Ina LJ um, Twitter account. It's me as the image because it's Ina LJ Naomi, but I try to have some sort of either books or people. The people in the, um, the header bar there, they're all people who are in either the interviewer or the interviewee of the top 10 interviews on Ina LJ in 2014. So I just made a fun little graphic with their images. This is my personal account at T160K. And I didn't explain this at the beginning, but T160K is um, it's a social purpose corporation. We're not a nonprofit. And we work with people that my colleagues know who are established and have been working for many years across Africa in arts projects, books, archives, music, dance, all kinds of fun things. These women um, in my header here are all um, expert Asmari dancers and um, musicians. They do a lot of callback. It's an Ethiopian style of music and performance art that's specifically women. Um, and they work at Fendica Culture Club. So every couple of days, I switch this out with one of our other projects. And yet, it's my personal account at T160K. The T stands for Timbuktu, and 160K stands for 160,000 manuscripts, the first 160,000 that they saved in 2012. And I'm happy to answer more questions about that if you have um, curiosity. But I also end up managing our general T160K account. And those gentlemen are actually librarians who are starting a cataloging project that we're crowdfunding for in Mali they're actually not in Timbuktu, they're in Bamako, in the capital, getting ready to digitize. But before you digitize, you have to know what you have. So to make the right choices about order. Cataloging, I think it's awesome. They don't, in Mali, they don't need Americans to come over and catalog. They have experts and librarians. What they need is funding. And so that's why I was excited to work about it. I'm like, I could do that. So once again, you don't want me cataloging, so. This is my Facebook for I Need a Library Job. I also have one for T160K, just to give you an idea that, you know, once again, it's me, but then I like to show some librarian friends. Those are all librarians in Vegas that I met. Really nice people. I like to share the stage. It's not just me, it's my volunteers, and it's, um, it's a wider stage. This is my LinkedIn public profile. Anybody can add me. I personally use LinkedIn in a way that LinkedIn <clears throat> is not intended. Um, I'll take on anybody because those connections, I don't know who it's gonna lead to. And I want to be able to connect with anybody, anywhere. Um, they say that's actually a bad idea, but for what I do as um, with an international scope, I found it advantageous. Um, having those one degree and two degree separation of connections has connected me to, to more interesting people. So that's just why I do it. T160K is on Pinterest, as you saw, um, and anyone can visit it. And we're on Tumblr now. So I tried to make my Tumblr look a little bit like our website, which is that one, our professional website. Um, so anybody can go to t160k.org and learn more. It's really interesting um, work that everybody's doing. So I highly recommend that people go ahead and check it out. As you can see, we've already raised $15,000 for this cataloging effort. That's awesome, and a lot of it came from librarians. T160K has a blog where I write articles. You can check that out as well. And finally, last but not least, and mostly because I'm running out of time and breath, INALJ.com. <laughs> there it is. It's the acronym for I need a library job. Probably won't forget that part at least. Um, feel free to check it out, look for jobs, see what's going on. And most importantly, and probably the two most important things on my website are the keywords for job searching, down here alphabetized on the left, where we try to add to it a couple times a year, different job titles that you know might sound interesting and you can learn more about. And at the top, our job site, which is organized by state and by country. It's not going to be a database anytime soon. People don't really pay us. Um, this is volunteer, and we do it because it's really addicting and exciting to see people get jobs. I mean, you know, you get hooked. 
And I'll leave you with um, something I was telling Joyce. One of my favorite um, stories about somebody finding a job on my site was relatively soon after we started. Um, I, I was an online student. I got into one or two online fights on message boards with fellow students. <laughs> we all had strong opinions. Clearly, we were both expressing them. And so I wrote to one of my professors, my YA, um, my young adult literature professor, apologizing. And she was like, no, I agree with you, because I feel that's relevant. Um, so <laughs> all right, cut to a couple months later. Now, I try not to remember people who, I do, I was joking at the beginning, but I try not to remember people who upset me because I'd like a fresh start. So I'm really good at forgetting names. Maybe this is an advantage, right? Well, here's an advantage um, after the fact. Um, that student I got into a fight with that we had to have like an intermediary um, wrote me an email so excited. They had found a job on my website. Um, at the time, it wasn't a website. It was a daily email PDF. And they got hired. That made my day more than if it had been a friend even. Because here was somebody who had clear reason to dislike me. I had not made their day. I had made their experience a little bit worse, and we were at the serial. Yet they chose to use my website, and they were celebrating this fact with me. If I can take people who don't even like me and <laughs> you know, do something for them, that's great. You know? and, and somehow something good came out of it. And maybe I learned a lesson. Maybe I never did. But, um, I was really happy to hear that. And that's why my jobs will always be available to anyone, anywhere, on the web, with no editing or filtering. I don't want to control access to this information. I just want you guys to have access to it. So with that, I will wrap up and we can ask questions. Um, once the applause is done, I'll introduce Claire. <laughs> I didn't know how to segue. <laughs> That's the first time I've done that. <laughs> Probably the last. Um, so, without further ado, <laughs> did, you want, did you want questions first? Or? Um, yeah, well, actually, I'll introduce Claire. She can come and sit with us. Yes, absolutely. So, um, I've had over 550 um, volunteers over the years. Claire is one of many. We got to meet in, in real life um, a couple, of, like a year and a half ago, and she's also a student and here. And I'm super excited that she was willing and able to sit in on the panel because she can give a very short introduction to um, what kind of job she's had. I briefed her so she knows. Um, <laughs> tell you a little bit about that. And then if you have questions, you're not just asking me. You have Joyce and you have Claire. Um, maybe I'll ask Claire a question. I don't know. <laughs> but it's just kind of fun. I had meant to bring on a bunch of different students and people in these great and interesting career fields, but apparently they all work in New York City and I'm not conveniently um, <laughs> located at the moment. Um, so I felt really bad. I also waited to the last minute um, that I didn't, but Claire was gracious enough to do this. So yay, Claire. And I guess I can stop. What is Claire talking about? Schmieder. Schmieder. I, I actually didn't say it on purpose because I was going to say Schmieder. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so Claire Schmieder, I'm so glad she said it first. Yeah. Thank you, Claire. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hey, I'm really excited I got to be here tonight. Um, I'm currently an adult services librarian at Cherry Hill Public Library, but that is a brand new position for me. I just started there about six weeks ago. Um, before that, I worked at a small nonprofit in South Jersey doing girls' leadership programs as a program associate. I also did social media, I wrote grants, I managed volunteers, I did a lot of the things I learned how to do in library school. Um, and before that, I was just, like Naomi said, my, everyone's career path is going to be a little bit winding. It's never going to be what you expect. I started out with a, getting a master's in public history um, from Rutgers, and I couldn't find a full-time job. I was doing freelance work. I needed more money. I became a mail carrier for the post office for a year. Um, and then I went to library school, and I was a TA for a semester accidentally. I was a grader for a couple other undergrad classes. So you never know where um, your career is going to lead you. One of the things that the way I branded myself for any library job was someone who was enthusiastic and positive and wanted to try new things. 
Um, I try to say yes to as many things as I can. Yeah. <laughs> but I take into account my time limitations um, and travel expenses and all those other issues. But I always try to say yes. Um, and I try to meet new people whenever I can, mm -hmm. connect with people online, have conversations. Um, it's been, volunteering for a new library job really basically saved, saved me professionally a lot, in a lot of ways. Um, after my first master's, I had a very, very difficult time finding a job, and I think I know part of it was because of my poor attitude. Um, and we've that, written many articles about yeah. poor attitudes on yes. our website, <laughs> and it was, and, and I can see in hindsight, I see it yeah. very clearly. I did not see it at the time. Yeah. Um, and being surrounded by a group of professionals who are positive, supportive, smart, and passionate, and who give you opportunities to speak at conferences. Like I'm going to be speaking at ALA this summer, which is really exciting with a couple other new library job people, and that all came about because of my work with a new yes. library job. And I'm a volunteer coordinator now. And so all of you should be jumping up, excited to volunteer, because we would love to have you. Um, it's a great way to get started. Do you get to get first vision of jobs? <laughs> Strangely, no, because each, um, each uh, individual page has a different head editor and a different senior editor. Um, so those are the people that see them first uh, and get them up. What, the, what we've had is an extremely high percentage of volunteers get jobs within a year. And I think that has less to do with what they see and more the attitude. Um, they have the support of each other. I'm not the only person they can go to. They've created you know, their own many level communities and friendships and jobs buddies. You need, sometimes you need somebody to help you. Um, who can help you out of the funk, so. Yeah, I mean, I review resumes and cover letters yep. for my friends, and they've done the same for me. Um, people have emailed me, oh, I just saw this job pop up, I thought you might be interested in it. Yeah. Um, and that, and something maybe you didn't see right away. Um, I mean, part of the reason I, I jumped at the chance to be a volunteer for any library job was right after I graduated, it was late at night, I was feeling depressed about like the job yeah. circumstances. And then Naomi, I think it, it was after midnight, um, <laughs> said, posted something on Facebook yeah. saying she needed, she was changing the way she was doing things at any library job. I we were gonna make it a website, it's not gonna be PDF, and I was like, I'll do it. Yeah. I'll be the I'll be the head editor for New Jersey because then I don't have any excuses at all. And yeah. <laughs> you know? You're already job hunting. Yeah, so. I'm already job hunting. I didn't have any excuses and I didn't um, I didn't know then how um, much of uh, support I was gonna get from that group. It became very it's and still it's very, very important to me. Yeah. And I definitely recommend it um, to all of you. If you're interested, we would love to have you. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And I want to, um, <laughs> because I'm one of those people that, it, this happens a lot, as soon as my husband start talk, starts talking, I'm like, eight things pop into my head. <laughs> and none of them are related to what he's saying, even though I'm nodding. I'm like, this is so exciting. But I did want to say that we have present one of my favorite professors here, Ross Todd, <laughs> in the very, very back, being discreet. Um, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed Rutgers, and I enjoyed taking classes outside of my comfort zone here. I think that's something also with Ina LJ. We're a little, all a little out of our comfort zones. Um, I went to classes with Ross and Lilia and Gracie Ann, who used to be here. Um, and, and I tried different things. And even though my career path has taken me over, he over here, everything I learn I can, I can refer back to. Um, and it's given me an appreciation for the people who do the work like what Claire's doing now. I mean, I've never been a public librarian, but I have an appreciation from having attended here and from also volunteer work of the people doing that, that those jobs. Um, I don't feel like one is better than the other. Um, and I think that's something that's, you know, Rutgers is very strong in. The broader the base, the more diverse we are, the stronger we are, the more value the degree has as a whole. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to add that in. Um, now I have. <laughs> uh, my excuse is that it's an hour earlier where I came from. <laughs> like it's seven, I want to go to bed. It's like it's midnight. No. <laughs> I flew the other way. <laughs> I don't know what my problem is. So, I'm wondering how many of the students here anticipate graduating this year? Perhaps. Perhaps. How many of you have already started a job search? Yay. How many have not? <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> that feels better. <laughs> um, so you must have, is it okay to do questions? Yeah. yeah. So I, I bet you have questions. This is your opportunity to really ask some experts. So what are you thinking? What are you worried about? What advice do you have for each other? 
Yeah, one of my favorite um, presentations I went to at ALA, um, we were talking on an international jobs panel to one person who worked in China, one who was in Kazakhstan. I was just talking about Ina LJ. It turned out the audience was just as helpful. I mean, so if I've said something and you're like, actually, I'd like to add to that or completely rebuff you, um, feel free to do that too because the audience turned out to have a lot of really interesting information. And that's another way, you know, to be remembered is not just asking, but like if you have anything you want to share. Gentlemen in the front. I actually have a question from our online audience. Ooh, exciting. Oh, by the way, I went to all my colloquiums online and I didn't realize that like all of my little typing was being recorded. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> it's a little late in the game. Dave, what's the question? The question is, how can uh, students and or graduates affect the conversation with uh, the employers out there that these are jobs that require a lot of specialized skills? except you know, some of them are offering $8 an hour, which should be $25 or an hour, or you know, I forget what the NGLA minimum is, mm -hmm. but it's not $8 an hour. Yeah, not anymore. I mean, I, it, it depends on where you work, and it depends on whether or not you need that. Um, it's really hard for a lot of people to, to, you know, they'll say, oh, go ahead, volunteer. You know, work these low paying jobs. Some people really can't do that. Yeah. And if it came down to it, the skills you get as a customer service person, maybe managing a customer service desk will be a value too. That's really an individual decision. You have to look at what you can do versus what you can't do. Um, I don't think there's anything that you as the job hunter can do to convince them because they've got the carrot, they've got the job until you someday get employed and have that power. That's where we need to be making the structural change. I've sat on many hiring committees. Most of them make good decisions. I've gotten into fights over bad decisions, but um, in the end, I mean, that's how change is enacted. It's really at the hiring committee level. Um, but yeah, it's an individual choice. Yeah, I was in a position where um, I'm married, I've been married only 12 and a half years, and my husband made enough money so I could take my time finding a job, but not everybody's that lucky. I was very, very fortunate to be in that situation. It was a bit of a privilege. Um, you know, I was staying at home with my kids at the time, too, but, um, so it was, I was not not working, but, you know. Um, so I could take my time and I could find something I really wanted, and unfortunately that is definitely, that is not the case at all for everybody. It is, it's better to be working at something yeah. You know, I mean, I think we're all valuable. Our skills are valuable. If you, it's, it just, it, it absolutely depends. Yeah. It absolutely depends. I, uh, I'm in the same position. I took a job because I have the luxury of taking. I moved back home with mom after my divorce, and so I kind of, I'm the handyman around the house, but I don't pay rent. So I took the job that's excellent, that pays like five dollars a year, and what. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, after a couple of years, I will be have this long list of stuff that I know how to do and things I've been exposed to and people I've met. So what I'm getting paid in is experience and knowledge. Um, but part of the reason I got that job is because I volunteered there, because they knew me. And it was luck that the job came available when I just happened to graduate. That's where I met um, Mary when we were both volunteers. Oh, right. <laughs> Mama <Right>. County Archive. <laughs> we talked a lot. Yes, we did. Don't talk when you're doing work. Um, <laughs> but they knew when the job came up, they all knew me. And so the interview was more or less a, because it was a government position or county government, it was kind of like we have to go through the mm -hmm. motions. But, you know, I got it because of the volunteering. So volunteer, I know it's hard not to afford it, but it was three hours a week, a week. So do it if you can. Even if you're not graduating, that's a great idea. Um, I, I'm a first year student. I work part time, lots of things. I actually do customer service at a place that I really don't particularly like. Um, get the best skills that. there. <laughs> um, I've actually worked a couple of part-time jobs I don't mm -hmm. like just to be able to get back into school. Um, and I live at home, but I still have to pay my own bills. But my mom was like, try and volunteer. I've been volunteering a couple hours a week, one day a week for about four months at my local library, and I actually just got a job. 
They were supposed to be full time librarians, but they're taking me on because they saw the dedication and I took the time out and they knew I had a job on top of that and was going to school. So it really makes a difference. It is, it is all about who you know a lot of times. In a couple hours yeah. a week is great because they know your face. Like Three you hours. Three hours. You. For me in DC, um, volunteering through SLA was important too, so through your associations, um, local associations, because they were the ones that all had the jobs was in, was in these, and they were jobs that were not well advertised. And um, once again, people want to work with somebody they want to work with. People like, boy, when you go to a job you like, um, that's fantastic. But um, great tips. And volunteering too, is, and networking. Like I applied for the job at Cherry Hill because I knew the director, who's amazing. I knew who my director supervisor was going to be in my department, who's amazing. It was the right job with the right people, and I applied. And part of the reason that I ended up getting it is because the director and my direct supervisor already knew me. They knew who I was professionally. I had spent time with them at different events and on Twitter, and they knew who I was. And that was it. And they, they were like, we had a lot of candidates. But like the reason we knew you, which is yeah. why we hired you. And you the know. committees through NJLA that yeah. you were on. Yeah, NJLA. and I'm, at, I'm very active in NJLA. Very, very active. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if you guys could talk a little bit about maybe some emerging jobs in the library world that Ooh. aren't. Uh, and by, by the way, the slides are already posted. So any, also, any, with and, the and tweet, tweet them out, please. <laughs> prospect, prospect research is one thing that yes. is a big emerging thing um, and actually a friend of mine who is an MLS graduate from Rutgers is working at Rutgers now in mm -hmm. prospect research um, and she uses all of the things that she learned in all the different classes about mm -hmm. searching and databases and analyzing information and all of it and does a really great job at it and they often post those job postings often say they want somebody with an MLIS. Also with prospect research, I had an interview at University of Maryland um, with their prospect research division long ago. Didn't get the job because I used as an example, so you t when prospect research, these are the people who give money to the colleges, these are the people who figure out how much money we think we should ask for. You get to spy on people yeah, basically. Spy, it's a lot, yeah, it's like <laughs> a little like CI. Yeah. So I had done research on the university, but I had not done research on their donors. So I was explaining how there are common names and you have to be careful to be sure that you're researching the correct person. For example, Bob Smith. And she looked at me with like attention, like waiting for the next thing. And so I said something like, oh, his name's common. That's a common name. Turns out their number one donor was a guy named Bob Smith. <laughs> I did not know this in the interview. Um, boy, I mean, bad interviews teach you more than good ones. Um, they don't. So if you do go into something like that, it's prospect research is also called development. Um, they have an association. We harvest jobs from them. We go to their website. We use their links, so you'll go back to them. But um, we, we uh, definitely make sure to get those up so you guys see them too. Hey, Naomi, one thing I noticed that I don't think you talked about was the notion of design in your branding. And so I looked at the fonts that you chose, the color scheme, the palette. Yes. Um, there's a style about what you're doing and the fact that you're intentionally using other people's images, not only your own photograph. Yeah. Um, it's, a, it, it's kind of a sharing. And um, is that important for us to consider? Sure. Um, I still don't have a logo for INLJ. I know what it wanted to look like. It'd probably take me five minutes to design it. I'll get to it someday. Um, in general, I kind of liked not having a logo so that it could be, you know, no matter what the font was. I just, I like PowerPoint and I like the dark background with the green colors. I just wanted to draw your attention using light green. Oh, I was thinking about your Facebook page, the oh. Tumblr. I was like, well, this isn't no, that no, great. No, no, no. This green. No, no, no. I was thinking that. <laughs> right? How yeah. to say that a different way. No, your, own, your, your personal. Sure, brand. sure. Um, I'm maybe less intentional than uh, a lot of other people. Um, so for example, with my Facebook page, like that header, I just try to share other people that are working on the blog or maybe are in our field and, and give them some recognition. Um, I'm not here today just because I had a good idea and I stuck to it. I'm here today because other people worked on it or other people liked it, other people used it. 
Um, so even though I'm extremely um, involved with keeping INLJ exactly as it is and perhaps not growing it, um, that's, I, I'm also very grateful to those people. I want them to shine as well. Um, so, you know, that, that's something to think about. You don't have to just brand as yourself. You can brand as part of a group. Um, if you have an idea and you think it's a great idea, go for it. Try it. I mean, um, that, that's how we all got started. Last comments, anybody? Um, like? Comments, Marie? Marie? No, I have a quick question, kind of. Um, <coughs> so you talked a lot about your failures, which was really valuable. Don't You're not a failure. You have failures. I have You're more self-confidence than I should, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> Oldest child syndrome. I wonder, I wonder if there's a way to brand what you learned from those. How do you do that? Um, well, maybe not so much in branding, okay, but, well, um, but, you know, I think that's kind of important to say, oh, I messed this up, but what I learned was... I blog it. So I blog it, and I talk about it, and I'm open about it, and I talk about it in, um, I want to seem self-aware, if maybe not fixed in my interviews, um, because... If it's, if it's big enough that I've noticed it, somebody else probably has noticed it too. So um, talking about those things, I, I think we're a, at least a pretty accepting field as far as I've seen, um, as, far, as far as that kind of um, honesty goes. There's uh, a preference actually for you to be yeah. honest and to acknowledge your errors and your people, failings. And when I go to things, I always ask people, um, I went to a marketing um, conference recently and I was like, please tell us what it, what didn't work because what worked is going to be what works for you but what didn't work is probably going to be something that's more translatable to the rest of us. Oh, one last thing I would like to suggest is um, if you have not registered for the NJLA conference, the rate for students is extremely low and it's a really good opportunity um, for networking and for getting together. We're having a fashion show on Monday night and that's the professional development committee which I'm a member of. Um, and you can learn a lot, you go to sessions, you can network, it's a lot of fun. New Jersey Libraries are the best. <laughs> <laughs> They're a lot of fun. I'll be speaking along with a lot of my colleagues and friends. So, mm -hmm. and Dr. Todd is going to uh, to close up, but I want your Twitter handles. We we know yours are in the slide. Claire, did you share yours? Um, my main one I use is I I N A L J um, New Jersey. underscore New Jersey. Right, um, my personal one I don't use as much, so I probably have five times as many followers. I'm going to be one. checking to see if you guys have connected with our guests yeah, and have thanked them <laughs> on Twitter. Oh. <laughs> Dr. Todd. Oh, the first thing I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he, has, he has a brand too, by the way, that I, <laughs> that I stole. Um, I took a selfie of myself at the United Airlines station in Newark Airport because it reminded me of Dr. Todd. <laughs> Look. I have to get some pictures of this. I <laughs> am just really honored to have Naomi and Claire here. I'm a mere mortal. <laughs> Naomi is a library legend, <laughs> truly folks. What does me really proud is that I had a little tiny part in Naomi's education because we did human information yeah. behavior online. <laughs> and from that time, you just know something about somebody. And then of course, the way that you have translated and transformed that learning into the the wonderful force and contribution that you've made and I'm just proud of you Naomi your accomplishments the work that you've done in engaging a whole community and that you are part of Rutgers our community and you continue to inspire and hold the banner high um, it's just such a real privilege. I have followed you so much, Naomi, to see what you do and the opportunities for each of you in taking this innovative, life-changing role in our profession is there. You grab the opportunities. But I wasn't here at the introduction, so I don't know what they said about you, Naomi. <laughs> but Naomi's not just a library legend, and I mean that in a positive way. 
Naomi is also an urban legend. And I mean <laughs> that in a positive way as well. I don't know whether Naomi told you, but I know that Naomi and her husband, Sana, have this totally amazing other life. Do you know what they do? They flip houses. <laughs> they flip houses. And, you know, I follow Naomi on Facebook. And so I see these totally kind of derelict places that they buy. And then we all go on this amazing urban journey of the transformation. And we even get to participate in the colour of the doors. Yes. And it's just absolutely extraordinary. So with great affection and for what you've provided for us and, and holding the banner high, you're both a library legend and an urban legend. Thank you, Naomi, Claire. Thank you very much.